We have a few. Oh, thanks, Alyssa. Okay, so why don't we get started with uh, the warm up act, which is uh, <laughs> me and uh, Debbie, as uh, as folks, I'm sure will keep uh, trickling in. I'm uh, really delighted to welcome you to the sixth annual Connected Learning Summit. Uh, that's fully online again for the third time. And um, I'm Mimi Ito. I direct the Connected Learning Lab, and I'm one of the uh, stewards and cheerleaders for this event uh, and really glad to see, you know, all of us, you know, coming together. I know it's can be, um, it, I know it's uh, challenging times for a lot of folks right now. So uh, I really appreciate this chance to connect with both our national and international community uh, in an online event like this. Uh, and just a tiny bit of background on Connect, Connect and Learning Summit, because I know a lot of people are joining us for the first time. Uh, you know, we were uh, a community that came together, the merger of several in-person events like Games uh, Learning and Society, Digital Media and Learning, and Sandbox Summit. Uh, we ran in-person for a few years before COVID forced some pivots on us, uh, but we decided to stay online because of uh, environmental concerns, uh, accessibility concerns, and just our desire to build a more global community, which uh, we've been really delighted to have chairs in Asia and Australia to try to extend the footprint be, uh, beyond our US uh, and European focus that's been historical for a lot of the events that uh, came together for the Connected Learning Summit. Uh, but we have heard uh, from folks that there is, you know, obviously still a desire for um, uh, getting together in person. So I wanted folks to be aware of the fact that uh, a, a lot of our partners are starting to support connected, what we're calling connected learning in focus events, cliff events, uh, that we've already had several. Uh, one that was hosted in uh, Brisbane by the Center of Excellence for the Digital Child. Uh, there was an uh, event hosted in uh, Tokyo in collaboration with the Chiba Institute of Technology around uh, neurodiversity and connected learning. Uh, there was an uh, event that we partnered with Playmake Learn in Wisconsin uh, that happened last summer, and a few more in the works, including one around connected well-being that we'll be hosting here at UC Irvine uh, early next year, and hopefully one on the East Coast that is still in stealth mode, but we're hoping uh, will happen. Uh, and uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to just thank our committee. I'm not going to read all of these names, but I did want to highlight that, uh, you know, this year we've welcomed uh, Debbie Fields as one of our co-chairs, uh, and she's really been uh, stepping up to take on a lot of the leadership of the event. And I want to hand it over to Debbie for the next round of thank yous. All right. I am so honored to be a part of this event. Mimi, thank you for bringing me in. And as you see, we have these fabulous uh, committee members who have reviewed papers, organized the conference. We have our, particularly our Asia Australia group um, doing the prizes. Thank you to everyone who is represented on this slide. Next slide. Also, thank you to our hosts that keep this conference going. A particular call out to the Connected Learning Alliance and the Connected Learning a Lab um, that uh, really ground this conference. Next. And our staff. These people work literally year round to get the conference going. You will see some of them. If you see them in Zoom, feel free to send them a private chat saying thank you for all the things you're holding together that we are not aware of including Alyssa right now, who's spotlighting us and doing all the little stuff in the cracks to make it all run smoothly. Um, if you need anything, please go to WOVA. If you go to this little community page on your left bar, you can ask organizers anything. They are very prompt at responding. And also next, we have a hashtag. So uh, use it across platforms. This will help everyone see what you're liking, favorite quotes, pictures, images, Feel free to boost your workshop or roundtable, and uh, we look forward to following that hashtag. Back to you, Mimi. Great. Thanks so much, Debbie. So I'm not going to stand between uh, you all and this really awesome plenary that 
um, we've organized for you. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to the organizer and moderator of this session, um, Bill Penuel, who's a longtime friend of Connected Learning, part of the original Connected Learning Research Network, uh, you know, um, master of all things design-based implementation research, science educator, also one of the leads of uh, AI and Learning Center that I'm sure you're going to hear about in the next few minutes. So I'll hand it over to you, Phil. Thanks, Mimi. Thanks, Debbie. And thanks, Alyssa, for organizing us. Um, so for this particular panel on AI and futures, uh, I just wanted to do a little bit of frame setting and say that we're trying to reverse the typical figure and ground here, asking not how AI advances are bringing us into particular futures, but actually starting with imagining alternative futures, ones that are more just, more sustainable, and then asking the role that AI might play in that. And in this discussion, we're going to explore themes of creativity, experience, epistemology, and of course, connected learning. Um, we'll have some questions that um, I'll pose of the panelists here. Um, I'm going to introduce them in a moment. And then I'll pose a question for the audience uh, and everyone to take up related to connected learning, invite people to respond either out loud or in chat, um, and then open up for other questions as there's time. Uh, so to our panelists, I'm gonna do a quick introduction and then they'll each start with answering a question that I'm gonna pose to them about the intersection of our topic today with their work. Uh, so first, Dr. Natrice Gaskins uh, teaches, writes, fabs, and makes art using, using algorithms and machine learning. And she's taught multimedia, visual art, and computer science with high school students. And her AI-generated artworks can be seen in journals, magazines, museums, and on the web. Her series of featured futurist po portraits were on view at the Smithsonian Arts and Industries Building through early July 22. And she's currently the assistant director of the Leslie Steam Learning Lab at Leslie University. Dr. Mark Rudell is a professor in the Georgia Tech School of Interactive Computing and Associate Director of the Georgia Tech Machine Learning Center. Dr. Riddell's research focuses on human-centered artificial intelligence, the development of artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies that understand and interact with human users in more natural ways. And Dr. Riddell's recent work has focused on story understanding and generation, computational creativity, explainable AI, and teaching virtual agents to behave safely. And Dr. Michael Cheng is a postdoctoral researcher at University of California, Berkeley, where he's affiliated with both the National Institute for Student AI Teaming, or ISAT, and the Center for Integrated Research on Computing and Learning Sciences, or CIRCLES. And within ISAT, Michael leads a team on co-creating co-design spaces that support the imagining of expansive futures for AI-supported education. Additionally, he studies how emergent technologies can be systematically integrated into processes of design-based research. Uh, thank you all for joining and being part of this. I'm so grateful to each of us, each of you. And let's start with our first question about what role AI plays in your creative intellectual work. And uh, let's just start with Dr. Gaskins here for this one. Hello. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good night. I'm not sure where people are. Um, so um, 30 plus years ago, I got into collage and uh, my work was inspired by artist Romare Bearden, who used a machine called a photostat to make large scale photo and, uh, reproductions. Bearden he, uh, made a practice of copying, redrawing and reworking his images. Um, so when generative AI emerged, I started using Deep Dream Generator, first as a high school computer science teacher and later as an artist. My first method was neural image style transfer and I got really good at applying artistic styles to my collages using Deep Dream Generator. And then since 2019, I've been making and sharing at least one gen generative AI or gen AI image per day. Um, I also have written a few articles about algor algorithmic bias and countering algorithmic um, injustice. Dr. Riddell. Hello, good to be with you all. Um, so I research artificial intelligence, so I guess it plays a role in my day-to-day -day business, but that's not really what the question is about, right? Um, so, but my research does involve, you know, what 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 Bill kind of, when he read my bio, was uh, human-centered AI. So what I really think about is um, healthy, sustainable relationships between AI systems and humans. So what 
how can we use artificial intelligence to enhance the human condition to kind of bring out the things that we kind of see as as human rights, human values, and, and just make those better for and more democratized for everyone. Um, and that's anything from entertainment. So how do we tell stories and entertain people, uh, have make playful experiences with robots, explain AI systems that are hard to understand so they can, you know, so that we're not confused when we're barraged by all these new systems that are being deployed to us on a day-to-day -day basis. And then making sure AI systems understand our value systems so that they kind of don't kind of get in our way of, of the, the, the long-term goals that we're interested in. Um, so, that all involves kind of finding the things that artificial intelligence can't do right now and then trying to figure out why they can't do them and then kind of attack attack those bits and pieces to make our AI systems better. But I also like to hack on the side. So I have lots of side projects that I do just to kind of keep myself entertained. And, and you know, because I'm a big geek, it all involves programming. Um, I don't use AI systems to kind of help me be creative. Uh, or to come up with new ideas. I like to think of that as something that I want to hold to myself. But because I do like to program up little computer programs and things like that and, and explore technologies I don't know, I often find myself turning to AI systems to help me with the APIs and things like that. So I do see artificial intelligence as an augmentation, um, as a skill enhancer. Um, and then I think a lot about like where is that separation between the creative aspects and the skill aspects. How do those interplay with each other? But I'll yield the floor before I talk too much about that. That's good, Dr. Chang. Hey, everyone. So good to be here today. Um, yeah, and I really appreciate this question because I really feel like, you know, it's given me a chance to kind of reflect on my own trajectory and like how the way I see AI has been completely broken the last few years. So just as a little bit of extra context, before I started my postdoc and started to work in the education space, I had my computer science, I had my degree, uh, PhD in computer science where I didn't do anything with education really at that point. It was really just thinking about operating systems, distributed systems, cloud computing, networking. And as I've really gotten into this space, um, it's just really fascinating to think about how artificial intelligence might play a role in my own life. Because so many of the ways as a computer scientist that I thought about building tools was tools for the individual, right? Even if we're doing social things, it's a tool for the individual. I'm going to build a social media site, but it's for the individual. And as Bill mentioned, my work in the last few years has really been about co-design, working with young people to imagine these you know, possibilities that they may not see in the day-to-day -day lives. And I think one of the things that young people have really pushed me to think about is how AI can support me in building relationships with each other, you know, rather than thinking about my relationship with the tool, it's my relationship with others and how AI supports that. And like that completely like broke how I think about things. And I think it really opens up like a lot of, like what's been sort of creative and fun for me in the last few years has been thinking about like, what are the sort of unexpected ways that AI might be able to support me in collaboration? And it was just talking with a computer science colleague a couple, couple days ago. And he was like, yeah, there's no way I would want AI to support me in collaboration. There's no way I could even see it. You know, he was talking about how, um, you know, him and his partner go around chasing their toddler to put a diaper on the toddler. And there's like no way that AI could support that. But then we're thinking about it, I was like, oh, you know, what if AI could kind of track, you know, where the toddler is escaping you and keep some patterns and then they could support you and your partner and sort of teaming up and then, you know, putting the diaper on. And it was just really fun to think about these, you know, unexpected ways in which, um, AI might actually support us in building relationships and feeling care for each other. Um, and it's just interesting to think about it that way, but also it's a bit unclear if we would actually, you know, my friend and I discussed this, we would actually want AI to support us in that way, especially with who holds the power around who's building it, the sort of ways and the sort of problematic um, issues that come up in the development, design and the evaluation of these tools. Um, but at the same time, it's also like a reminder that you know, that AI is like everywhere. It's it's opening up possibilities and closing off possibilities that kind of whether we like it or not. And I, I just really, you know, appreciate the chance to think about it in more sort of ways that I wouldn't have thought of before. Thank you. So I think this question is kind of for all of us to think about. Um, we talked quite a bit as we were preparing 
about the conversations that are happening around AI right now. There's so many, there's a lot of buzz, but you know, what strikes you as something that we should be paying attention to in this? Um, and I'll let anyone uh, jump in to start. So um, although then um, I want to say that the 1900s, you know, I'm going to go back a bit, ushered in the age of mechanical reproduction. Artists have used machines to make art since the 1600s and likely long before that. Uh, a lot of the fears expressed by critics then remind me of what happened like with automata, which are referred to clockwork machines designed hundreds of years ago to mimic and recreate life. It seems like every age and era in modern Western history is obsessed with machines and the historical blind spots such as race, class, and gender bias often carry over from the previous eras. So that's what strikes me is some of the same things happening um, now also happened in the 1600s. And in 2000 and 1990 and 1980. Now, uh, so I think it's fascinating that you started off there because when I teach my intro to AI class, I also start with automata from the um, the Renaissance and the Enlightenment periods because I think it, it, humans have always had this fascination with the artificial and what it means to to have artificial entities do things that we traditionally thought of as human um, endeavors, right? And so the same themes keep coming up again. But I also think like even recent history is really, really kind of important because these debates and conversations that, you know, we've been having today about the nature of AI, and the replacement of humans and, and what it means to automate jobs, you know, happened in the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s, although with different AI techniques. And I find it very instructive and informative to know the history of artificial intelligence, um, to bring in kind of the old conversations from the debates to see how they can inform the new conversations, as well as just kind of like in, in everyday research, like if you're building AI systems, like there are philosophies, thoughts, problems that, you know, were in vogue um, at a different time that also can shape the way we think about new technologies or even kind of help us find new problems or new new ways of solving new problems to say, oh, well, actually, this is a problem that people experienced in 1990. And, you know, maybe if I apply this here, I can work my way out of, you know, some weird thing that a chatbot is doing um, right now. Um, well, kind of one more point along that, like when, when ChatGPT came out, I guess, within the last year or so, right? That was oftentimes, like AI people have been having these debates a long, long time ago, right? But that was really the first time where a vast majority of the population, at least in the United States and the West, were really exposed to artificial intelligence and started thinking about these things. And it's, it's shaped a lot of the perception on what artificial intelligence is in a very narrow way. Um, and I think some people have a hard time of, kind of thinking beyond what they have directly experienced. So if you've ever logged in, like your first experience as a chatbot, it's hard to think about things that are not chatbots, uh, for example. And that has also kind of shaped the dialogue and research as we've gone forward. Michael, you wanna add? Yeah, and thanks Mark for bringing up the point about sort of how that imagination is shaped by the recent events. Cause it's really been something on my mind as well. Um, especially as I move through these co-design spaces that I've been um, creating. And I, I've also just been, you know, reading a lot of, um, I guess, articles or press releases from tech companies. And there's really seeming like at tech companies in particular, like lately I've been seeing a lot more things around uh, working with partners, working with youth, working with teachers, and, um, you know, that so much of the discourse, I feel like, is kind of drawing from the technical space. Like, you know, I'm a product manager by training. I do these end user tests. I go and ask people how they feel about things. And it's like, okay, this feels like important work to start to ask people kind of what they feel about technology. But then also, I think it raises questions about sort of, you know, how that imagination of technology in that co-design process is sort of connected to the recent discourse that you just, that you just brought up. Um, and I think it's so interesting also to think about like what discourses are privileged over others within these sort of co-design contexts. Um, like in particular, I'm thinking about, I saw like a couple months ago, um, Summit Learning, uh, which was a Chan Zuckerberg founded, um, I guess, organization. They do like this personalized 
um, you know, AI learning in a bunch of charter schools. And I think they've expanded much beyond that. And I think they recently had a bit of a pivot and they were like, and their posting really emphasized how much they engage with students and teachers um, in their work, which I found to be really powerful. And at the same time, led me to wonder, like, you know, in the 2019, 2020, we saw lots of cases where there were students protesting in New York um, because they felt like, you know, they weren't getting any social interaction. They were spending too much time in front of a computer when using like summit learning, um, when using the summit learning tools. And, you know, why is it that, you know, I just wonder like, why is it that those voices were ignored at that time? And then now at this point, there's sort of that shift where there's that emphasis in engaging partners. And I guess for me, something that I'm really paying attention to is, you know, how are sort of these tech companies who have a lot of power in this space, and a lot of power in controlling the discourse, talking about co-design, how are they sort of complicating that process, like understanding what young people and teachers are saying beyond just like, oh, this is the object that we're saying, we're, we're, we're proposing, but really understanding sort of the sense making, the contradictory sort of ideas and ideologies that are going into this process. Um, and I really think that, you know, there's a lot of work right now that, you know, I've engaged and I know many others in this space also have engaged in that really think about co-design outside of the asking for feedback on user interface perspective. Um, but I, I guess for me, you know, maybe this connects to Natrice's point as well, like thinking about, like, I th would really love it if there was more attention paid to from people in, um, in ad tech and thinking about sort of the relational and ethical aspects of co-design that are so central to to this work. Um, and I wonder how far that will go and whether, you know, we'll, there's other like sort of histories that repeat itself, you know, through this process. Thanks so much. Well, let's get into the heart of the topic that brings us here today. And I want to ask, how can AI help us imagine new futures or create new things that don't exist? And what are your hopes and worries for AI as a tool for imagining new futures and for creativity? And we'll start with Natrice here and then, then I'll invite Mark to add to, on this one. No, Natrice, I think, I think you're, you're muted. You're muted. Sorry. Um... Uh, I was trying to mute when other people were talking. Um, so I was saying that the very nature of generative AI, um, because it's not really AI, it's a big umbrella. We're really talking about chat GPT normally, uh, other imaging programs and stuff, um, which fall under gener generative AI, which involves, I think it involves possibilities sometimes that outpace what we can do with our brains and hands in the present time and space. Um, gen, gen AI kind of extends time and space um, we can generate or produce quadruple the amount of digital images in a single prompt. Unfortunately, as I said before, the historical biases are still embedded in these systems. And a few days ago, I was revisiting a text prompt in mid-journey from months back that was inspired by blues mu musician and songwriter Robert Johnson, who um, you people know about the crossroads and all that stuff is a well-known blues musician. And so the tool offered up four variations, including a startling image of a blue skin, guitar playing man ape, like eight feet, the ears, everything. So I was also upset about the result that I immediately deleted it. But um, so Gen AI often automates and perpetuates these historical, often unjust discriminatory patterns. And we see that um, and stuff like that, it pops up. There are diff different forms of representational harm that result from biased outputs, such as the underrepresentation of darker skinned people in socially admired or valued groups, and the overrepresentation of socially um, of darker skinned people in socially denigrated groups. Um, I think artists can intentionally apply ethical interventions to counter this bias, but this often requires having multiple skills or skills in multiple creative processes and tools, such as you know I often use Adobe Photoshop, not the AI generators in Photoshop, but actually uh, Photoshop to either remove, revise, um, uh, model or mold different um, things in and out of images or composite images because of the uh, output that's happening. Um, and using Canva, uh, Canva that's used by teachers in schools a lot has an AI generator. And when I, cause I just a month ago was in Brazil, I used Brazilian dancer as a prompt and it kept giving me, has a, a stronger filter than Midjourney. 
and it kept giving me alerts, um, warnings about images. So I couldn't get a lot of images for the word Brazilian dancers seemed to be triggering something that was filter was filtering out um, in the uh, process. So it's just uh, awareness that this is, uh, while there's this opportunity and these possibilities, there's also these um, things that happen that can be very upsetting. I'm done. Yeah, it, AI is such, for creative purposes, it's such a double-edged sword. I mean, on one hand, like I mentioned before that I don't use it to ideate, but I use it to enhance you know, places where my own skills or abilities are deficient, right? So I love playing with text to image generators. I just, I play with them all the time. It's like, I have, I have a cool idea for an image. I want to just do it. And then I feel really good about doing it because I can't draw, right? But now I can make art and that's amazing to me and it feels great. Um, but I think, you know, also we kind of have to re remember that um, what most of these um, deep learning systems are doing, whether we're talking about GPT or we're talking about mid-journey or stable diffusion, is they, they try to recreate their data sets. Like in a perfect world, you would give it a prompt and it would be a prompt that it's seen before and it would recreate it, the exact image that it had. Now it can't because there's error and noise and lots of technical reasons why you can't recreate your own data set. So you end up with something new and unique um, at, le at the image level or maybe at the word level uh, to varying degrees. Um, but I think like the reason why I don't use it to ideate is because I think the, these large language models and these text image generators, they're all kind of trying to take us back to the mean. Um, now, if, if the mean is a space that you really don't know, and it comes up with something that you've never seen before, or it comes up with a new kind of a text response that you've never seen before, that's still an incredibly powerful and useful thing to you. Um, in, in creativity research, we talk about um, uh, P creativity versus H creativity. P creativity is personal creativity. Um, I This is new to me. I've never seen it before. And that's a really useful and powerful thing to, to have said, all right, here's something new. Now let me think about that and take it the next step further and come up with something new. H creativity is historical creativity. Like has this ever been created or anything similar to this in the history of all humanity? And I think, you know, we often kind of confuse H creativity with P creativity when we're using um, AI systems, but there really is a kind of this, this balance between the two, right? I'm not saying that one is useful and the other. And, I, and as I mentioned before, like, where does ideation end and skill begin? You can and can't say. So I think as long as we are aware of what the AI systems are capable of doing for us and aware of how they want to respond to us, then I think we can use them kind of judiciously and, and appropriately and effectively. So how do you all think that we can ensure that the experiences as well as the hoped for futures imagined by historically and systemically marginalized youth are preserved as we enter into CS and also education spaces, spaces where that are, have really different experiences, epistemologies, practices. Matrice, we'll have you start again here and then have Michael add this time. Um, so we can create opportunities for youth to intervene in Gen AI developments. For example, I discovered a youth-led workshop inspired by work at Mission Bit, which is in the Bay Area. Um, so I had no idea that this had happened. Um, they had chosen these youth to use my work as uh, inspiration for their workshop. And they were inspired by my process of using processing programming language output um, in my generative AI process. So it was actually creating styles using uh, processing um, and transferring that into the images I was uploading. So um, this idea of experimenting with different um, features and techniques, for example, that enhance darker skin um, using certain images and colors. In a sense, I created my own space to learn, create, and practice. And by sharing this, um, I've created quite a following of people who may have felt like they were not allowed or are able to be in this space. I've had um, at a, a keynote that I did in the summer, I uh, had a woman come up to me in tears, a black woman said, I didn't realize that there were black women in the space um, and then started to cry again. Um, so I've, I've, you know, encountered women, especially that have been very inspired by, you know, the images that I post because I'm in the space 
with a particular way of creating images that touch on a particular experience that isn't represented in the mainstream or what we see when we talk, generally we talk about Gen AI. Um, so young people um, also are paying attention and they're inspired by the work. Yeah. Um, oh, I can just add from sort of my experience from, I'll say a little bit more about the co-design work that I do, um, as it might help to provide some context. Uh, basically, I lead a, a series of workshops within um, the NSF AI Institute that Bill mentioned earlier. And the goal of these workshops, essentially, is to surface youth's sort of expansive, or what we call expansive hopes and dreams around schooling. So think about possibilities for schooling that kind of exist outside of the status quo. And then to understand like within those equitable hopes for what things look like, what is the role of artificial intelligence within that space? Um, and one of the things that we really heard time and time again in our workshop, and you know, all of our youth were, um, were um, historically minoritized youth, and they really talked about how oftentimes within schools and within collaborative spaces, they really wanted to feel heard, they wanted to feel listened to, they wanted to feel believed and respected, right? And that was something that so often was not afforded to them within these spaces. And that was the vision. And they also came up with all these really cool, like concrete looking technologies um, that you know, they felt would kind of help them, but really it was the institutional change that they felt was, you know, what they wanted in their in their schools. And then part of the challenge of taking these ideas into CS oriented spaces is that, you know, from my experience, at least computer science spaces don't really value any metrics of institutional change or equity as kind of like central aspects of what they're evaluating, right? We're looking at lat latency, bandwidth, throughput, p-values, accuracy, things that really don't often have a lot to do with these ideas of being heard and respected and valued. Um, so I think one way of like seeing this is that if we bring this into, if we bring these like sort of big ideas into computer science spaces, oftentimes we might end up just building the technology and the technology can be appropriate in all kinds of ways that go away from what the young people asked for. Um, but really for me, I'm thinking about like, how do we sort of build teams of researchers, how do we sort of build partnerships with organizations that really help us, you know, collectively, you know, collectively as in computer scientists, learning scientists, educators, et cetera, to put our ear to the ground and really listen to the experiences of what like young people are asking for. And then going from, and then like basically creating tools, practices, shared visions across computer scientists and, and, uh, and educators and learning scientists to think about you know, how we might sort of center the speculative, disrupt technical norms, and value these like different ways of understanding, designing, and reimagining that that come up in these spaces. And I think there's just really so much powerful work to draw from that really needs to be uplifted that center like indigenous and black epistemologies and practices and technology and society of design. And I think that's something that really, really has to be carefully and intentionally brought into uh, CS spaces. So one of the things, and in, in, um, Mark's already brought it up a little bit, but it's AI can't do um, some things that we might want it to be able to do. And I'm wondering how we can engage in conversations about technical feasibility without closing off possibilities or restricting ourselves to the most narrow of possibilities for what AI can do. So Mark, maybe you can start us off and then we'll have Michael pick up. Yeah, this is uh this is a tricky concept because I kind of already mentioned like <clears throat> the things that we're exposed to shape our 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 expectations and and what we think and you know there's a lot of conversation that's just kind of a very, very small boundary right now around what large language models can do or tech text to image generators can do uh, generative AI. There's a lot more that um, can be considered, but you know, how do we get ourselves out of this kind of mental kind of roadblock of thinking about, all right, well, if I could just throw GPT at this and GPT at that, you know, can it do that? Uh, sometimes it can, sometimes it can't. Um, but there's actually kind of this other dimension that's that's playing along as well, which is people overestimating what the technologies can do and thinking that, you know, it'll do this or it'll do that and, and it really can't. Um, 
So I think both of these come in as both negatives as kind of make it kind of hard to, to figure out how we want to to imagine kind of the, the futures we want and how do we get ourselves out of those sort of head spaces. Um, you know, I think for me, I kind of turn to two kind of sources. Um, I turn to science fiction, um, especially older science fiction predating 2017. <laughs> um, and especially the positive ones, right? There's a lot of negative science fiction, a lot of Terminators, sorts of things like that. But but you'll find these uh, these great examples, the Star Trek Enterprise, the 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 helpful AI systems in in Interstellar, um, things like that, that do provide kind of visions of ways that we may or may not want to interact with computers in the future. Um, and they were not bounded by reality. Now you kind of go in and say, well, all right, what makes it possible or impossible for that to happen? And if it's possible, how do we do it? Or if it's impossible, how do we do the research to try to make it more possible? Um, the other kind of source I look to a lot is human-human collaboration. So I do this a lot with um, creativity. Like teams often collaborate to make art, right? Art isn't always done as a single solo thing, right? So let's look at like the close dynamics of what actually happens between two people and then figure out, well, where where does a AI system that we know how to build now, where is it not able to do what we can do? Or where is it able to do what we see people doing? And can we find ways to unlock people's potential that way or find ways to make the relationship between the AI and the human more natural? Um, so those are kind of the heuristics that I kind of try to bring to bear. Michael? Yeah, um, I think about like the use of technical feasibility a lot within the space of dreaming about equitable possibilities. I think partly because there are, I think as Mark mentioned, there are like very real like constraints that with what we can do technically. And I think we are starting to get a better sense of what that looks like. At the same time, the way it's sort of deployed within social contexts, I think often really, really reveals, reveals like some of the um, like other like sort of ideologies that come into that space and don't often follow those same rules. So I think like, I think an example that I often think about is, you know, I, I there was a conversation I was having with a computer scientist um, a couple years ago about, you know, various possibilities of using natural language processing um, in schools and sort of like these two ideas that come up often are, can we have an AI that calls out racist talk? And then can we have an AI that sort of identifies like on topic or, whether students are going on topic or off topic, just two common sort of discourses, I think. Um, and I think, you know, as as many of the folks here know, I think like a lot of that on topic, off di topic discourse has been, um, you know, can often be like sort of a proxy for, you know, calling out particularly youth of color as being disruptive and naming them as sort of off topic contribution when really it can be like sort of a rich generative space uh, of learning for, for everyone in the classroom. Um, and I think what was interesting in this space was, you know, we often hear, we, I heard from this computer scientist that, you know, an AI that calls out racist talk is not technically feasible, while an AI that sort of calls out off-topic speech is feasible. And, you know, those are, like, I think both of these tools should be problematized for very important reasons, but also the fact that um, even though they use very similar underlying technologies and one of them is being called out for feasibility and one of them isn't, I think raises really important questions about how we even construct and understand technical feasibility as a way of closing off particular social possibilities for, for technology that go beyond sort of, you know, something that we might consider to be um, objective and neutral. Um, and I think, you know, towards sort of engaging in conversations about it and thinking about, you know, how we might sort of get around these issues. Um, I think one of the things that I've sort of attuned myself to, and I think others within the co-design space that I've sort of been working with have also done is to notice when there are possibilities for dreaming that are, um, so when there are expansive possibilities for dreaming that are kind of closed off when um, claims of feasibility are kind of used as a way to say, oh, I don't disagree with the, you know, the ideologies that you're talking about when you're bringing up these expansive ideas, but it's just not possible. It's not feasible. You know, it can't be done. And I think, um, 
it's a really important it's really important to be able to notice when those moments are happening and to also um, surface how there might be sort of alternatives which might be able to get past that that sort of initial like rejection from feasibility and to understand that there might be other ways of doing things. Um, so really like sensitizing ourselves to this idea that technical feasibility is kind of constructed oftentimes within, um, you know, I think about code design context, but I'm sure this happens in lots of different spaces and then sort of identifying when that's happening and really engaging with the complexities of these issues that they come up as they come up. Thanks, Michael. I know, so as we're doing in ISAT, Michael, I know we're you know we're creating new forms of AI for the classroom, but we're also talking about uh, using AI to create new things and new uh, using new kinds of applications, and that's seldom sufficient for realizing more expansive futures. Um, I'm wondering if you could start us out, Michael, and then I'll have Natrice add. You know, what are some infrastructures that might support AI and actually being able to use in the creation of imagined futures, either for education, for society? You know, and, and when is AI even really needed for that? Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, I think, you know, kind of this idea that I've been harping on during this panel has been this idea that young people were looking to be heard, respected, um, cared for. And I think like recently what I've really been thinking about is how do we sort of create these infrastructures that support young people in being cared for? And what is the role of AI in making that happen? Or what is the role of AI in making that harder and harder to, to achieve? And when I say like infrastructures of care, like I'm really thinking about like, you know, oftentimes when I talk to young folks, what I hear is that they were like reduced to numbers, right? They're, they're a series of grades and their grades get put on some bulletin board and they get ranked and, you know, teachers and administrators will care about them, but only insofar as it relates to sort of the formal academic metrics, right? Grades, um, are they submitting their FAFSA? Are they getting their college applications in? But anything beyond that, you know, jobs, personal, community, societal, um, structural factors, it's not really something that they're really seen in their wholeness for. And like, these are really relational deep challenges, you know, and if we're really trying to think about how do we try to create the schools that young people are asking for, like, I think it really begs, I think it's really tough to imagine how AI kind of goes into that space and something that I've really been grappling with, um, grappling with a lot, and especially as it feels like, if anything, AI is bringing people apart so often, like, it feels like it's, like, I feel like so much of the work is around isolating people, trying to put them in front of computers and personalized learning to them, but really it's not really like engaging with the relational view um, of AI and really like relational, like, sorry, the relational aspects of school and learning that are so important. And, um, you know, I really have just been wondering lately, you know, how, um, how we might be able to create the infrastructures within schools. So through, whether it's through curriculum, um, whilst whether it's through finding ways in which we might be able to bring the home into the learning space, into the formal um, educational spaces, and maybe thinking about how AI might have a role in bridging those spaces. Um, I guess that would be kind of on sort of on theme with the connected learning themes, um, but really, really engaging with, you know, this really centering care as the foundational orienting goals towards thinking about how AI goes into educational spaces and realizing these expansive futures. Thanks, Michael. Natrice, you want to add to that? Um, I just put a link in the chat to an article I wrote for uh, Tech Trends on um, interrogating algorithmic, algorithmic bias from looks at the ed tech um, development um, in terms of AI and looking at things like Afrofuturism, and, and um, speculative speculative fiction and 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 even films um, related to help ideas of 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 engaging other voices in the conversation, um, and I and I kind of concluded that you know we need to sort of balance uh, users as critical digital agents of change while ensuring that the solutions that come up provide a safe space for encouraging them to learn about AI and algorithmic bias, and I think that ed tech developers can learn from things like what I mentioned in terms of speculative design and Afrofuturism to examine the darker side of AI and provide sort of uh, fictional and non-fictional scenarios that address the current needs of the historically marginalized and underserved. 
Um, and so, you know, I'm not just an artist in the space, I'm a, you know, PhD in research, but I'm really interested in ways that um, we interrog interrogate what's happening both as a creative pursuit, but also looking at it from um, a practitioner and research pursuit uh, area as well. Um, so feel free to read that. It's, you know, my sort of my answer to, to the question. Love it. Thanks so much. Um, and I can already see some of this starting to happen in the in the chat, but we're going to turn into the theme of this particular summit now directly and talk a little bit about connected learning. Uh, and with this, I'm going to invite our panelists to start off and invite people to add in the chat um, some of their ideas or answers to this particular question. And once that plays out, we'll um, add, you know, go, go back and try to see if there's some questions from the audience that you guys would like to pose of our, our panel. Um, so, you know, we're talking about connected learning, forms of learning that are interest-driven, collaborative, uh, relational, as, as Michael was saying, and, and that also extend across multiple settings, uh, including perhaps schools, but also well beyond uh, the schoolyard. Uh, what would school and community spaces need to look like for connected learning to be universally accessible in your view and equitable? And, and also what, what role might AI play in that? Um, and so I'll open it up to any of our panelists to, to start um, and then uh, invite people also to add their ideas in the chat for this too. And, and if our panelists want to engage in any of the ideas in chat too, uh, please feel free to do that too in this at this yeah, point. Yeah, I've already kind of done it, but yeah, I saw that. So yeah. it's great. Uh, but let's keep that keep we'll keep it going and and uh and get us started. I, you want I, to start, I, Patrice? Yeah, I just wanted this to note, and I'll put a link in another link in the chat that we've been um working with urban high school teachers to apply creative computational skills to educational projects. So we have these summer courses that merge developments in machine learning, such as face sensing with art and robotics. So in 2021, the course took place in a high school and, um, and online because it was uh, COVID. But uh, we also in 2023 was 100% in person at the university's art college. And the students had access to phys the physical space to work on their projects and store their projects, as well as a digital fabrication lab with 3D printers and laser cutters. Um, the students came five times a week, nine to five each day long two weeks and they produced the capstone project. And then their families and the community came in on the final time so they could share their, their projects and they received both high school and college credit as well as stipends from the city. So this was a way to, we wanted to target students who normally would not take a robotics class or a computer science class, which is very high um, uh, in terms of happening at the high school, they have having a difficult time attracting certain groups and still struggling, but making some inroads. So we really wanted to work with the teachers to figure out a way to create a space where students felt like they could be there, even though they normally would not go in those um, into those courses during the school year. And so we've had these two times. And so I'll put a link to that. But part of it was bringing the university, college university together with the city and then with the high school, um, with the teachers on board, all of us learning together, and also doing things in the classroom with the students that helped them feel more included and helped them feel more that they had a voice in the process. So there was a protocol to even the way we ran the classes. Thanks. Mark, Michael, you wanna add any thoughts here? Well, I guess I can say a few things. So I'm a little bit of an outsider to the connected um, connected learning community, but I have um, spent a fair amount of time thinking about AI and educational settings from an inquiry uh, driven, kind of student driven kind of research questions. But in the last 18 months or so, I kind of started going through this um, co-design process with um, teachers in engineering um, classes. So these are the classes where you get to build your bridge or your egg drop sort of thing like that. There's some sort of education, engineering principles that you want to learn by doing. Um, and we went through a lot of the things that we talked about in this panel. So, you know, how do we imagine how AI might come into the classroom and be effective and useful in various ways and getting around the, no, that's impossible, or no, that's just chat GPT, you know, <laughs> uh, those sorts of things. But, you know, at the, at the end of the day, kind of, the, it all came down to 
um, this observation, which I think is probably obvious to everyone, but maybe not to computer scientists, which is what teachers really wanted was anything that allows them to spend more time with the students um, in one-to-one -one or small group collaboration. So anything that is taking time away from that should be automated. And for example, deciding when someone has permission to go to the bathroom, right? Teachers don't want to deal with that. Like, and that's like, okay, I can write a rule system for that. That's two lines of code. Is that even AI? But I but the thing that I think, you know, ended up being really interesting and useful are connecting students together. So figuring out when students should help, seek help from other students, which is an interesting AI problem. Um, and then also helping teachers think through the reflective sorts of questions that they wish their students were asking of themselves and then prompting the students to, to do that. So the, the right question at the right time is often all that a student really needs. And if the teacher can't be right there at that right moment to have that effect, can an AI system kind of give the teacher the ability to kind of be at three places at once? Not to teach, right? No teacher ever said like, we want the AI system to tell them how to do it. They wanted the AI system to say, well, have you considered this question? Just think about it. And then the teacher will eventually get there and, and there'll be a more fruitful conversation. So I think, you know, if there's anything here, it's like, you know, we really have to think outside the box, um, find these creative ways to, to, to slip technology into to what's really a human to human process. I think Michael said it really well. It's like schools are so much, education is so much about socialization, right? And interpersonal interactions. And how do we, how do we augment that? How do we make that even better? When ultimately we're asking, how do we take something that's not human and make humans more interactive? Michael, you wanna to add to that before we open it up? Yeah, I can give kind of a concrete example from our work that's happening in ISAT right now. Um, so one of the tools and one of the sort of tools that we're building in ISAT, it was called the Community Builder. And that's a tool that came directly from the, our workshops with the young people. And what the Community Builder does, it's basically it's an AI which helps young people stay accountable to collaboration norms that they themselves have agreed to. Right. Um, and one of the challenges of of getting Kobe or getting this community builder to work in schools is often that there's a very like fixed, not fixed, but very like established set of like um, community norms that I think are very like appropriate for schools, right? Like kind of be nice, listen to each other. Um, et These are all important. We should have them. But at the same time, they're not really celebrating sort of the, you know, the, the cultural practices and the sort of different ways in which people might collaborate and work with each other. And especially within the context of schools, we found it to be really hard to bring in like um, learning and collaborative practices from other contexts into the world of schooling. Um, and I think part of what um, I think we like one of those one of the things that we've been doing to try to you know bring this AI into the space of sort of beyond schools is by creating sort of modules or sort of home learning modules where young people like work with their parents to learn about how they see AI together, their collaborative practices, and then using that as a chance to one not only sort of you know talk about AI in sort of these more expansive ways. Um, but also to talk about collaboration in more expansive ways and bring them back into the classroom and really complement, you know, this AI tool that we have with sort of these everyday collaborative practices that we really want to uplift within the context of the classroom. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Mimi's got a lovely question. I'm wondering if anyone would like to, to take up about the metaphors and AI and moving beyond the sort of human companion, helper, co-pilot, metaphors and uh, I'm wondering um, what other metaphors you think that we ought to be exploring here. She's got some of her own, but I wonder if, if you want to add. Yeah, I added the cipher information yeah. in the chat. So um, we started the day with the cipher. We ended with the cipher. The design breakouts were ciphers. We brought the community in to review the students' projects on a the cipher. They review their work. It's like a cipher, it becomes a way. And what we noticed, like, especially a couple of years ago where students who were not, often felt like they didn't have a voice. We all had masks on and you could barely hear some of the students, even when we were asking them to speak out. And then by the time we got to the end of the program, you could hear them clearly, um, mask and all, where they're feeling more included and then more of a voice. And 
there were times when we ended the session, they would form the circle on their own without being told because that was part of their day. It's a different, it was very different for the school teachers to see that and to see that inclusion and see how that, so it was really inspiring, for, I think, for the teachers to see because they're used to standing from the classroom and just talking, you know, having, you know, even a half circle, but still in a very formalized uh, setting versus this other kind of way of doing it. So, um, which I was trying to bring in some of the elements of what happens in an actual cipher and hip hop culture into a robotics, AI, computer science space. Beautiful. Thank you. Mark or Michael, you want to add to metaphors? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the, I often turn to the human metaphor. So what would a human, a human, human interaction that's successful here look like? And what aspects of that can we bring over to the AI side? And, and I think human is too broad, right? Cause human have, can take on so many roles, right? We could be teammates. We could be mentors. We could be, uh, apprentices. We could be subcontractors. We can be, did I say coaches, or pen pals, um, things like that. And, and coach is actually kind of an interesting thing. So to say, I've got, I might have this really powerful AI that can do most of what you're doing, but maybe I don't want it to do it. So think of like a soccer coach on the sidelines, right? There may be a better soccer player than you know, their high school soccer players that they're coaching, but they're not on the field, right? They're only allowed to kind of shout a few hints and suggestions and then let people figure it out. So, you know, there are ways that um, I think humans have figured out how to interact with each other uh, that are very interesting. And can we kind of say, well, you know, we don't have to build the end all be all AI that teaches and does everything, but it just has to be in the right place at the right time in the right way. And how do humans kind of know when to do that? And and can we kind of take guidance and hints? So I think, I, I you know, I think the metaphors we have are often, you know, getting us in the right direction. And we could just take it a little bit further. Well, who you want to add? I mean, I know we've really talked a lot about metaphors and, you know, I sat quite a bit and maybe share a little bit about some of the history of metaphors that we've gone through and, and where we've landed. I'm wondering if you might speak to that. Um, yeah, I, I I wish I remember the exact metaphors that we started off with, but you know I think it, and, and uh... right, right, right. <laughs> I think a lot of our initial metaphors and I said were really oriented around um, like shepherding students, like keeping people on task, like in collaboration. And as sort of we've as sort of as we've as we've gone through these workshops and really listening to what the young people today are asking for in the classrooms, what we've really started to pay attention to is this relational aspect of it. How can students be in better connection with each other? How can they be in better connection with their teachers? How can they feel cared for, right? And I like the idea of a soccer coach a lot. I think we have a similar idea around like a hype person, right? Like, like especially around like issues of equity um, within collaborations, right? I think so often, like, especially when we work with non-dominant youth, we see in public school settings, especially it's like, oh, like I have this idea, but it's like, oh, that's not, it's not quite right. It doesn't fit. It's too imaginative for this space, right? But then to have like an AI that's kind of like a hype person that says, hey, we want that. That is exactly the kind of thing I want to hear more about. And, you know, hopefully bring in other people into that conversation help people feel like, help students, particularly non-dominant youth, feel like they belong within that collaborative space, I think is something that, um, like as an institute, I think we've sort of all gravitated towards and really felt the power of as we've been building out um, and refining our metaphors even more. Thanks so much. Panelists, any last comments that you want to make? Um, Our hour is almost up, but I wanted to give each of you the last word to add anything more. No, I think, you know, for me, my introduction to uh, this topic came from teaching. I was teaching uh, advanced placement computer science principles to students in an art high school. And so I was always looking for ways to bring computer science into the arts. And that's how I found generative AI. Um, and then we could talk about AI in that context to engage them. And most of those students were girls and most of them were African-American and Latino. So it was a real test to see if we could... Uh, do this stuff, but get them to stay, keep them interested for a year. And so then I got into it as an artist, but that was later. Well, 
All right, from you, the last thought. I like to flip things around. So you talk about bringing computer science to art, like what happens when we bring art into computer science? Like the humanities are, are such a, an amazing, powerful tool to think about kind of and critique the, the status quo. And, you know, we need to go the other way too, right? We need to kind of humanize our computer science, our, our AI kind of techniques, philosophies, research um, procedures and methodologies. And Michael? Um, I would just say that, like, I think it's just so, so important to, like, be really intentional and, like, really think about, like, what young people and teachers are asking for. I think they know so clearly what they want. They have a very strong sense of it. And and that's changing all the time, you know, like what's what happened five years ago isn't true today, probably, you know, similar to what uh, both Mark and Natrice have referenced today. Um, and their own understandings are changing. Their own understandings of themselves are changing as how to identify as a student changes. I don't know. I feel it just feels like we really, really have to, as we think about what the role of AI is in schools, we just have to constantly be listening, constantly be on the ground, constantly be like really listening to what they're saying and what they're asking for and what they're hoping for and what they're worried about. Thank you. Uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Natrice Gaskins, Mark Riddell, and Dr. Michael Chang for a really wonderful panel. Thanks so much for joining today. I really appreciate your conversation, the conversation in the chat, and of course, all the resources that you've been dropping to in the chat. So. Thanks, everyone, and uh, I hope everybody has a good rest of the conference. So, it's been wonderful. Thanks so much. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day, evening, whatever.